Hello everyone. So we have a new couch. We've had it for a couple days now. I, I like it so far. I've got a bunch of pillows here that I'm leaning on so hopefully that will help me. Hopefully that will help me breathe as I'm doing this video because I'm anticipating that at some point midway through the video I'm going to start to get really out of breath and I don't want to have to be trying to reposition midway through so this is where we're at. I actually have notes for this video this time. So hopefully that will keep me on track. I've got a lot to talk about. I'm going to be doing a response to this video that uh, Buck and Jill put out where he talked with a lady whom he identified as Eve, so I'm going to be calling her Eve. And they talked about some stuff that I think is really important, but I think it's also very important that I do a response video and just add some commentary to kind of flesh out some of the subject matter because they were covering a lot of information and when you cover a lot of information sometimes it can be helpful to you know just make sure that everybody's on the same page because there was a lot of new information it was actually really delightful listening to it because I always like something that feeds me lots of new information and uh, it definitely did that so jumping right in at 6 minutes and 30 because I've got my notes here uh, she was talking about AGP and AAP deepening and intensifying as you feed into them um, I've heard this before, and I, I have not really experienced it, and perhaps that's because I just don't consume a lot of porn. Because she talked a lot about porn, and how porn consumption kind of really deepens these, these sexual fantasies. For myself personally, so much of my autoandrophilic experiences have not necessarily felt sexual in nature. I don't watch I, I don't I don't watch much porn at all really and when I did have moments where I was really really excited to be mistaken for a man it never it never seemed sexual like it just did not seem sexual at all so of course there's the story about like when I brought it up to my therapist she was horrified and I was just sitting there like I didn't think this was a sex thing like I guess it is a sex thing. You look like I am confessing to you about like my secret puppy killing habit or something. And so I'm assuming this is a sex thing, but you know, I I I, I don't know I don't know how that works and I don't know I don't know enough to weigh in on it, but it's interesting that she's mentioning it. At seven minutes and ten seconds she says, uh when we take away, ooh, I need to adjust this, it's a little too bright, it's glowing on me. There we go. Ooh. Oh. Ha! Ah. Okay. So at 7 minutes and 10 seconds, she says, when we take away trans rights, uh, these people, and I'm assuming she's referring to the public freakout branch of the trans community, uh, will need long-term, quote, unquote, uh, long-term inpatient mental health care. I'm assuming she's talking about, like, public freakout trans people, not just ordinary trans people and not AGPs and that's something that I would like to say. I doubt all AGPs are going to automatically need inpatient mental health care. I just don't see that happening. We do have, obviously we have a lot of problems with mental illness in our country. There are, there are cities where people are wandering around biting people and it's like, okay, well, you know. At 8.10 when Buck equates these hyper misogynistic trans women with AGPs, um, I have to disagree. I have to disagree with that. And Buck isn't the only one doing it. I think every prominent, either conservative or centrist trans individual, like every public figure who's transgender has come out at some point and said, yeah, it's those AGPs that are the problem. I can think of, I mean, Brianna Ivy did a video about it. Blair White has talked about AGPs a few times. Marcus Dibbs talks about AGPs. AGPs and AAPs. It's like, oh, well, they're not really trans. They're, you know, they're, they're fetishists. And that's how it keeps coming across. That's how it keeps getting communicated. It's like, well, there are real trans people and then there are AGPs. And I just, I don't think it's that simple. I really don't. And so that's kind of one of the reasons I'm making this video. I really don't think it's that simple and I'm pretty sure we're going to get into it as this video progresses. At 8 minutes and 40 seconds they refer to an interview that Buck did with an AGP. I tried to find this interview and I couldn't. I suspected that they were talking about Phil Illy, in which case I would have really liked to have seen that interview because I, I like Phil Illy's work. Call me biased, but I, I think he did a good job with his book and I think he's, 
he's done a good job about raising awareness of autogynephilia and autoandrophilia. That's how I kind of found out about my own situation. Because up until that point, I was just a very confused person who was, like, trying to figure things out, but I didn't know what to make of it. And so I'm very, I'm actually very grateful to him for being so open and so willing to discuss it. Because most people just aren't. I understand that she's looking and saying that he's trying to normalize AGP, but honestly, there is a certain extent to which I think AGP should be destigmatized and perhaps even normalized. I'm not saying that our society needs to embrace it with a big, friendly, cuddly hug, but I am saying that as it currently stands, people like to... This is why I said it was difficult to breathe. Um, people like to take AGP and kind of characterize that as the bad trans or the fetishistic trans or the fake trans where it's like, oh, well, those are the ones who are just, th those are the, those are the public freak out trans. That's what it is. It's just those AGPs over there. I just don't believe it's that simple. At 12 minutes, 30 seconds, she talks about, as she puts it, getting the toothpaste back in the tube, um, in other words, just fixing the rampant insanity in the trans community. It, it seems like she's put a lot of thought into this, and so I was really happy to hear that in the interview. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna say something, I'm gonna disagree with them on a few points, and that's, I don't want you guys to interpret that as me disapproving of the conversation they had, or disagreeing with them on a grander scale. I think they made a lot of really good points. I think there are some things though that need to be kind of clarified if you're going to have that discussion, so I'm kind of trying to help clarify these things. I think that what she's doing by having the conversation that she had with Buck Angel is the best possible first step. Um, I strongly believe that if people understood what transgender really is when you've got like HSTS, AGP, ROGD, yeah, they need a better term for it, but ROGD, for lack of a better term, and like intersex related transitions, which I haven't, I've met people who've done that, but I'm not familiar with how that all works as well. Um, but I think a lot of the craziness around pronouns and like DIY gender identities would go down considerably once people become, in a more mainstream sense, more broadly aware of the existence of things like autogonophilia. And I mean, I have a note in here. Um, I remember being taught this crap when I was in gender studies class in college, which was an embarrassing long, long period of time ago. And I mean, what was it all based on? I mean, it was a lot of hot air. That's what it was. All the, the gender queer and the non-binary, all of it. It was just, it didn't have like any basis in, in studies or scientific fact. A lot of it was just theoretical. Whereas when you have something like autogynephilia, you've had sexologists who sat in a clinic for a long time studying a lot of patients and writing papers and being like, I think this is what's going on with these people. And so there's a reason that I kind of tend to look at Blanchard's work and I have this knee-jerk reaction of, oh, I'm not sure this is exactly what's going on, but I try to approach it with an open mind. And honestly, the dude's probably right. At 1335, they hit one of the biggest points in their discussion that I want to talk about. And that is when she defines a paraphilic disorder. She only talks about paraphilic disorders in this conversation. And I mean, it's a conversation that focuses on paraphilic disorders. That's cool. That's good. That's important. There's absolutely nothing wrong with them having a discussion that focuses on paraphilic disorders. We need to raise awareness about that. So this is good. This is good. However, she did not differentiate between paraphilias and paraphilic disorders. And so I've got this quote from this article by uh, Cambridge, and it says just very quickly, in the case of paraphilias, a new distinction is made between a paraphilia, which is an atypical sexual interest or behavior, and a paraphilic disorder, a mental disorder stemming from the atypical behavior. I, I think they were just covering a lot of information and they didn't make that distinction or take the time to point out that that is a distinction that can be made. But honestly, if you take anything away from this video, that's probably the most important thing to take away from this video as it is a response to this discussion. I swear I'm not dying, it just feels like it sometimes. 
Um, there is a difference between a paraphilia and a paraphilic disorder. And you might be sitting there going, really, really, is there, is there really a difference? Like what kind of a difference? Okay. Okay. Here's the difference. 50 shades of gray, not the best quality of writing. I've got to say when it comes to novels, not my cup of tea, just the writing was not good for me. I struggled with that, but 50 shades of gray was ridiculously popular. Now, paraphilias can, can, paraphilias can span a broad range of behaviors. There are a lot of different paraphilias out there in the world. It's always going to be an atypical sexual interest or behavior. So, I mean, there are people who are sexually attracted to balloons. And that's a thing. The difference between a paraphilia and a paraphilic disorder is that the person with a balloon paraphilia has some of their favorite balloons at home and they either cuddle with them or blow them up and then let the air out or maybe they blow them up and then pop them. They do that sort of thing with their balloons. The person with the paraphilic disorder can't control themselves around balloons <laughs> and has problems in their life because they get excited by balloons to the point where they they're experiencing problems in their day-to-day -day functioning. And that's an oversimplification. So what does that have to do with Fifty Shades of Grey? Well, Fifty Shades of Grey was massively popular. What is Fifty Shades of Grey about? Well, it's kind of sort of touching on the subject of BDSM. The number of people who were titillated by that is just huge. Did it do a good job of communicating what BDSM is in like real life practice? Not remotely. It did not do a very good job of that at all. And I knew people who were in the BDSM community at the time that Fifty Shades of Grey was popular and they bought copies of the book to read it because it was like, okay, what's this about? And it was just so bad. Like it did not portray the community realistically at all, but it was a fantasy story and I mean God bless the lady who wrote it. More power to her. I'm glad that she was so successful, but the writing was terrible. It was obviously a first time novel. It was obviously a first attempt and it was just just bad. I couldn't get through more than a couple pages. The large scale popularity of that particular book which featured that particular paraphilia. Um, I think a lot of people are really turned off at the idea of paraphilia as they hear about something like coprophilia which is you know anything to do with poop and they they think okay so these people are all nutcases and it's like well it's not that simple because Fifty Shades of Grey was a really big deal. Like, y'all can look at it and be like, oh, that's gross. Paraphilias are gross. And people who have paraphilias are crazy. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, is that a copy of Fifty Shades of Grey on your shelf? Well, that's not mine. Really? Because someone has read through it until the pages are starting to get worn down in the corners. So someone clearly enjoyed that book. Well, it's a secondhand copy. Yeah, I guess. Must have been because damn, you know, that's that's kind of what I'm talking about. There's a lot of people who like this stuff who maybe don't feel comfortable admitting it, but it's a lot more I think it's a lot more prevalent than people realize. Um, as an interesting side note, if you are going to look at AGP as a paraphilia instead of like, and, and I mean, that that is one way to look at it as a paraphilia. If you're going to approach it in that way, then you can, you can take that and apply it to the pronoun game and come up with some really funny results. Uh, for example, if you take BDSM terms like master, no, practicing member of the BDSM community, no no sane one at least, would go out in public and demand that their co-workers or maybe their wait staff at the restaurant refer to them as master. Like that would obviously be very sexual and very inappropriate. Well, if AGP is a paraphilia, which AGP is a paraphilia, going out into the world and insisting that people refer to you as Zeezer or 
you know, bunny bunny self is equally inappropriate and equally sexual and equally kind of gross if you think about it. This is one of the reasons I think a lot of members of the trans community don't want to discuss autogynephilia. They want to sweep it under the rug because if you if you just if you just think about it long enough, it can be very problematic for the trans community very very quickly. <coughs> and I've got a further note on here that I should probably add in very quickly. Not all of the people with the weird crazy pronouns are AGPs. That's something to be very much aware of. When it comes to autism, many young autistic people are gender nonconforming. And so a lot of autistic people have kind of jumped onto the gender variant non-binary bandwagon because they find themselves to be gender non-conforming and they're trying to figure out a, a you know a reasonable explanation for why this might be and they're being taught all this crazy gender stuff in like high school and so they identify as some made up gender because they don't feel particularly masculine they don't feel particularly feminine and then they apply some new pronouns to themselves because they're told that that's what they should be doing and, you know, try out new pronouns, see how it feels. I've read articles that tell me to do that and I'm just sitting there like, well, no, but that's interesting that you're advising people to do that. And so, you know, they're being taught, young people are being taught that this pronoun game is something to be taken seriously and if people don't respect your pronouns, like and memorize them the first time they hear them basically then they're being disrespectful so a certain amount of this respect my pronouns or else kind of zeitgeist is is a result of people who are you know for example autistic who've been taught that they should expect this kind of instant respect for pronouns that they have picked out for themselves you have AGPs who are using this to just kind of get their rocks off. You also have people who are young who have been taught that this is how to how to be. You have narcissistic individuals who are using this to coerce people around them and gather up a little bit of power for themselves because it feels good. You have a huge mess when you're dealing with the pronoun soup that exists in the non-binary community it's just it's just messy but it's not all agps that's th these people this group of people the public freakout people they're not just agps there's a lot of things going on there at 14 minutes 20 seconds she mentions the paraphilias occur in clusters i think that actually makes a lot of sense to me i know that for myself i do have paraphilic tendencies they do tend to be a cluster of multiple paraphilic kind of uh, kinks or turn-ons. Do I ever talk about those on my channel? No, actually, this is the only time you're probably ever going to hear me mention them. Do I have clusters of paraphilias? Yes, yes I do. Is it a paraphilic disorder? No, because it doesn't interfere with my day-to-day -day life or really any aspect of my life at all. And honestly, I would say when it comes to my sexuality, um, my autoandrophilia isn't even the biggest in that little cluster. It definitely doesn't seem to be the most uh, strong influence in my sexuality, which I thought was kind of interesting, because autoandrophilia seems to much more affect my day-to-day -day life, my day-to-day -day behaviors, elements of my life that I would consider to be not sexual at all. That's where I see more of my autoandrophilic side. In the bedroom, I've got other things going on, which, again, um, between two consenting adults exist and it's no one else's business than that. So, <clears throat> moving on, <laughs> this is one weird thing about deciding to talk about, uh, about autoandrophilia. When I first started talking about it, when I first came out about it, the number of people who have made really wild and very weirdly inappropriate, um, assumptions about my sex life I kind of, I guess I understood that that was probably going to happen, but it's been weird. Like, people are guessing I do all sorts of things in the bedroom, and it's like, how is that any of your damn business? Just, just saying. 
Um, I've got an article here on kink and intelligence that I need to go over. Of course, it's not in my notes. It's not in my notes. So, interestingly, there is a correlation between kink and intelligence. And when I say kink, I mean paraphilic behaviors and intelligence. There was a there was a scientist who studied it. The problem is it's really hard to do good studies of this. However, it's been a repeating kind of theme. It was something that I knew about and was aware of like a decade ago when I was hanging out with a bunch of the BDSM crowd. There is a, um, a correlation. And so when everybody's always pointing out like, oh, these people are just mentally ill because there's a lot of people, especially lately, who've been approaching me and saying, well, this is just a mental illness. No, it, sex is, sex is, among other things, not just a physiological activity, but a mental activity. And so if a person is of a higher intelligence, and I mean, we're talking like, more than a standard deviation higher than the norm, they're going to seek out some additional stimulation. And what they found, and I need to post this little quote up so that you can actually see it from the article, and this is only one article, so I mean, fact check me, please. I, I would actually appreciate that. This was all very cursory, like, research. The lady in the lady in this in this interview, she's done a ton of research. Me, I spent a weekend reading up on papers and asking questions in Google. So yes, please do fact check me. But um, when it comes to intelligence, uh, the article was talking about how this particular uh, scientist he worked with sex offenders. Because a lot of the inf a lot of the information that we have on paraphilias, a lot of the research that is done on paraphilias, of course, is dealing with sex offenders. And oh my God, how do we stop this? You know, this is abnormal. So how do we stop it? They're not interested in the person who cuddles with balloons when they're at home in their apartment. They're much more interested in pedophiles and necrophiliacs and rapists. They're trying to figure out what that is because that's actually a problem. Balloon guy at home, cuddling his balloons, not bothering anybody. Nobody cares because it's not a problem. It's not disruptive. Again, the difference between a paraphilia and a paraphilic disorder. One of these things is disruptive, the other is not. Yeah, when it comes to consensual paraphilic behaviors, people who have who have made consensual arrangements to interact with other people and do these behaviors together have higher IQ on average. People who are sex offenders with paraphilic disorders, on the other hand, actually have a lower than average IQ. And that's kind of interesting. Like that's something to kind of, you know, something to make you go, hmm, I wonder. At 15 minutes, 50 seconds, she talks about a scale of progression. And when she talks about this progression that I'm assuming she's talking about paraphilic disorders, where it ramps up, it ramps up, it ramps up. The individual who's suffering from the disorder steadily becomes more out of control of their behaviors, more out of control of their thoughts and fantasies, more out of control of the entire situation and, you know, frequently more alarmed by it. That makes sense of paraphilic disorders. Me sitting over here with a paraphilia, I mean, I, I'm 37 years old. I've been like this for a really long time. I have not personally noticed in my own behavior any kind of a progression. And then the question is, well, maybe I'm just not feeding into it because she talks about porn and avoiding porn and how she hasn't fed into hers. And I'm not entirely sure that it hasn't grown with me throughout my life and deepened and become more enriched as my understanding of myself has become deeper and more enriched. But I wouldn't say that the paraphilia has in any way like taken on a life of its own or gained any kind of control or hold over me. I finally become more aware of it, more conscious of it because for a long time, for many years, I was just sort of shoving it in the closet, going, well, I don't know what this is, but I don't want to look at it too closely. Now I'm, now, now I have a term for it. Now I have an idea of it as a concept in and of itself. And so now I can 
pull it out and play with it as an existing concept within my own mind and explore it. And that exploration has been quite pleasant because it helps me understand my own self a lot better. Has it affected, you know, has it deepened in the sense of gaining control or gaining a foothold on me? Not to, to my awareness. Now, you might be looking at my hair and thinking, well, she's just got her head in the sand, that's it. I don't think it's that simple. I honestly think in many ways having addressed it and kind of put a name on it and, you know, taking the time to identify how it's affecting my life and the various ways that's affected my life through the decades that it has been affecting my life has really helped me to gain a better sense of control over it because it's like, oh, okay, I know what this is now. So um, I'm assuming that, again, she's only talking about paraphilic disorders here, which, I mean, it is a conversation about paraphilic disorders, but uh, there seems to be some difference between how a paraphilic disorder functions in a person's life or dysfunctions in a person's life, really, um, and how a paraphilia just is a part of who a person is throughout their life. And again, this is something that I can say I've seen most clearly in my interactions with people who are part of the BDSM community. When they're involved in consensual relationships, it's not growing out of control or spreading like a wildfire or taking hold of their life. It's something that they and their chosen, you know, partner who is consenting do together that they, you know, gain a lot of mutual enjoyment and stimulation from. And so it's not, they're, they're actively exercising it, but it's not deepening or taking hold in any kind of ominous or concerning way, which again is why, is why, you know, a lot of psychologists in the Cambridge article it was really interesting they're talking about all the problems that they're having when it comes to writing out the DSM and talking about paraphilic disorders without inadvertently stigmatizing perfectly healthy not harmful human behaviors and it was a really interesting article. I've got a link down below. Definitely, if you're interested in this sort of thing, take a look at that article. A lot of it deals with like sex offenders and things like that because that's where a lot of the research goes. They want to understand problematic behaviors so that they can control and stop problematic behaviors because those are alarming and harmful. But they do talk about how there's a lot of these behaviors and a lot of these paraphilias that aren't inherently harmful. They might be weird, but they're not hurting anybody, and so, you know, let's not stigmatize things that are not actually bad, which is, is difficult to do. Normally, I'm a little bit critical of modern psychology because I think there's a lot of wokeness that got into modern psychology that muddied the waters. But in this particular case, I think that they're just trying to be intellectually honest when they're making up these rules in the DSM where it's like, you know, if we write it out this way, this person who has this problem isn't going to be diagnosable, so that's a problem. But if we write it out this way, this person who clearly does not have a problem is going to end up being diagnosed with something really severe and terrifying, and that's that's not cool either. So how do we write this out in a way where we can distinguish clearly between people who have a problem, which is a paraphilic disorder, and people who are just, you know, kinky. Some people are just kinky. And I know that a lot of, a lot of pride and a lot of, a lot of people have been advocating to like bring kink into the mainstream and they show up for pride parades and like bondage gear and stuff like that and it's like you know what I personally just a personal opinion of mine I wouldn't want someone to show up to a public parade having P and V sex like just right out there where anybody can see it so why would I be okay with someone showing up to a pride parade in bondage gear getting whipped on the back of a truck, like a pickup, as it's driving through the parade? Because for me, those two are way too close to the same thing. 
And if one of them isn't okay to do in public, why the hell are they doing the other one in public? 810, once again, I think they're referring to Phil Illy, but I haven't found this interview that they're talking about. I need to do a little bit more digging on that because I'd love to see, I'd love to see another Phil Illy interview. That would be really cool. One of the things that uh, I think is interesting, um, and I, I can't remember exactly what they were saying at 810. I just was like, I think they're talking about Phil Illy here, but I can't tell. I think when it comes to autoandrophilia, like, I mean, there, there are other things going on for me. And luckily, I found a partner who was, you know, very, very accepting of me and my unique quirks and isn't bothered by my quirks. And so the two of us have been able to maintain a really healthy and mutually satisfying relationship. And I can be weird and that's cool. <laughs> so that's that's very important. But um one of the things that I notice is, like, the things that affect me in the bedroom, you know, most intensely are not things that come outside of the bedroom. Autoandrophilia, on the other hand, is something that follows me everywhere I go. And you might be sitting there saying, well, that sounds like more of a paraphilic disorder, but it's not like it's I, I was trying to think, okay, well, are there any ways that it's negatively affecting my relationships with other people? Because when I do make friends, and I'm being very much myself, so, you know, being a little bit more tomboyish, a little more autoandrophilic, I used to joke with people that I wasn't a woman, because I thought that was funny, because I was tired of people trying to treat me as this, like, stereotype of a woman, and so it's like, dude, I'm not a woman. Like, it's that simple. Just that 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 explains it all for you right there it simplifies everything um and then i found out that i was an autoandrophile it's like well that joke didn't age well Ooh, has that interfered with my ability to form healthy relationships with other people no the only point at which my autoandrophilia really became an issue and i'm not sure that it was an issue socially was when i was dealing with my creepy coworker that i had to report for sexual harassment and it's like, okay, was I reporting him for sexual harassment because I'm an autoandrophile and he wasn't treating me like a man? Or was I reporting him for sexual harassment because I'm married with kids and he wouldn't stop hitting on me and then when I refused his advances, he tried to get me fired twice? I'm going to go with option B there and say that the problem probably didn't originate with me. 1825 is Buck and AAP. That's something that came up. And I mean, it, it's possible. I don't want to, I don't want to sit here in this video and be like, oh yeah, I think he is, or oh, I don't think so. I don't want to make conjectures about other people's sexuality unless I know them really, really well. And I'm like having that discussion with, you know, more or less their blessing. Because, I mean, I, I've got enough people making all sorts of weird assumptions about my sexuality. I don't want to do that to anybody else. But one thing that I will say is that I've seen a lot of trans YouTubers, uh, trans commentators, who aren't necessarily like big name trans commentators. Like the big name ones, you kind of start to recognize them. They're pretty. <laughs> I don't know a better way to say it, but they, they've transitioned and they look good and they're public and they're, you know, they they look the part really, really well. And then there are all these other ones who are kind of a little bit more underground, who maybe are detransitioners or people who transition, but then they detransition and then they retransition, stuff like that. Um, they're much more quick to say, oh yeah, this public figure over here is an AGP. This public figure over here, clearly an autoandrophile. This public figure over here, also an AGP. They're quick to point that out, and they have examples of behaviors that do look... The problem right now is that autogynophilia and autoandrophilia are so stigmatized. They're, they're absolutely demonized in the trans community. Everybody is very, very happy to take the public freak out trans person and say, well, that's just, that's an autogynophile. They're not a real trans person. They're over there in their own category and they're just a pervert and a fetishist. And that's the reason that they're acting like a complete fool in public. Um, and uh, no, that's not me. I'm not, I'm not one of those. I'm not like that. And um, 
I think it's safe to assume that frequently uh, there are people who are saying this who do not realize that they themselves are autogynophiles. I think that's safe to say because I didn't realize it was an autoendrophile. And the category is broad enough and enough of the experiences that you can have as either an autogynophile or an autoendrophile are not... They don't feel sexual. It doesn't feel like a sex thing. It feels like just part of who you are. I'm a very effeminate man. Or I'm a tomboy. That's just how I am. That's just me. That's just who I am. And so linking that up with, oh, is it a sex thing? It's hard. It's hard to make that, that jump. It's hard to come to that conclusion. And um, it doesn't mean that it's not happening, though. At 18 minutes and 40 seconds, she says, he's a transvestic fetishist anyway, and kind of laughs, and that's sort of the last that's said about it. And I'm sitting there watching this video thinking to myself, okay, what the heck is a transvestic fetishist? And I did eventually see the term. It's in the ICD-10, so not the DSM, different different diagnostic manual. And they never they never go further with it. They never address it. They never talk any further about it. And I'm not sure that that's even I'm not sure that's even helpful. If you're going to have a discussion about paraphilic disorders, which are bad and alarming in many cases, you need to actually have that parallel discussion of, well, these are the scary things, and these are all the not scary things. Because if you just leave people with the impression that the only things out there are the scary things, there's going to be a lot of very harmless, innocent healthy, happy people who are going to be absolutely demonized for behaviors that are not pathological. So if you if you use a term like, oh, trans transvestic fetishist, and I understand their focus in the conversation is paraphilic disorders, but if, if you use a term like that and say, oh yeah, that's what this person is, instead of having a paraphilic disorder, well, what does that look like? What is that? What does that mean? I understand they were going through a lot of information. I'm not trying to be critical here. I'm just saying we need to have that discussion as well. This is another discussion that must take place. If we're going to have the big, bad, scary discussion, we have to have the, yeah, there's a lot of harmless shit out there too, discussion. 1850, they're fetishizing. This is something that they're talking about. Um... I, I still, I'm still trying to figure out a way to express accurately how not fetishistic it can sometimes feel because it's very easy. I think a lot of people want to make this very simple equation of, you know, AGP equals fetish behavior. And so any AGP person who goes into a bathroom is being fetishistic. They're trying to get their rocks off. And any AGP person who wears a dress is being fetishistic. They're trying to get their rocks off. And it's, I don't think it's that simple. I think it's important that Buck and Eve were having the conversation they were having because there are people who are predatory in the trans community who are doing some really not nice things. There are people who have paraphilic disorders who are active in the trans community doing some really creepy creepy things we need to call that crap out so i'm happy that they had the discussion they had but you can't just come up with a simple equation agp equals fetishist and gross and weird and you know paraphilic disorder it's not that simple agp occurs in more than just paraphilic disorders it occurs in paraphilias and even in my own case, while there is that autoandrophilic tendency in the bedroom that does sometimes crop up, the thing that I really notice is how it threads its way through so much of the rest of my life in a very organic feeling kind of fashion. Like when I tell people I'm basically just a tomboy on steroids, 
I really feel like I'm just a tomboy on steroids. Now here's one of the big points that she says that I really want to hammer out. Like I, I was talking earlier about making it very, very clear that there's a difference between a paraphilia and a paraphilic disorder. That's very important. This is another one of those big, big things that is very important. The more I read up on it, the more I think about it, the more I think that this is a very important issue. How are we doing for time? Oh, shit. Well, sorry about the time, guys. Um, and that is at 19 minutes and 33 seconds, she says, not every paraphiliac is a sex offender, but all sex offenders are paraphiliacs. No. I'm sorry, no. And she goes on to repeat this a few times, and I am afraid that she is wrong. I think she's just wrong. And, I mean, this article that I was reading, uh, I believe this is the Cambridge article, I, I screenshot it on my phone and sent it directly to the printer, so it's huge, like it's huge text. But uh, it says right here, a further important limitation to the current diagnostic criteria for paraphilias is the confusion regarding their relationship with sex offending and criminality. Not all sex offenders have paraphilias, and most people with paraphilias do not commit offenses. And they're, they're quoting a study here. Double check the study, okay? This lady's done a lot of research. I'm not saying that she's wrong. I'm just saying that personally I find myself, the more I think about it, the more I try to make the math add up, the more I find myself disagreeing with her on this statement. And it's not just, it's not just this one article. I don't think, I don't think anyone is going to question that there is a correlation between paraphilic disorders and sex offenders. Like, there is not... There's clearly a correlation between these two things. People who are sexually aroused by raping people are going to be much more inclined to rape people. But when she says all sex offenders, she's wrong. When I got raped, in my own case, let me let me tell you how that went down. This guy was not, he wasn't a paraphiliac. He just, he he wasn't. What happened was, I was 20, I was living in my small hometown, I was building an escape plan, and I needed to fix a lot of things about myself that were very broken, I've talked about this a lot on my channel, and I had a, a boyfriend, a quote unquote boyfriend at the time, he was, I think it's safe to say he was a very narcissistic individual, can't say for certain that he was a narcissist, but if you want to know what he was like, just look up the DSM's description of a narcissist. That guy. I was dating that guy. And you might be sitting there going, well, you were stupid for dating him. And it's like, well, yeah, but he was actually the better option compared to some of the other things that were out there. Small, small town, very small dating pool. You kind of had to deal with what you could get. And that's kind of where I was, where it was like, this is a very bad person, but at least I can... I can stomach being alone with him. At least I don't feel a sense of revulsion when we're affectionate with each other. And I'm going to take the win, you know. I'm going to just call it call it a win and, and, and live like this. I hated my life. I hated my circumstances. I complained about it constantly. And I was told that I was being too picky. And he was one of the only guys I knew that didn't immediately turn me off in a very big way. So I was just dealing with it. He wanted an open relationship. I didn't care. So he was sleeping with a bunch of other women. I know he was. He lied to me about it all the time because he lied all the time. And one of the things that made him interesting was sitting around picking apart all the lies that he told me because that at least gave me some intellectual stimulation while I was hanging out with him. Because everybody was weirdly boring in my hometown. And I had decided that I wanted to go to a strip club, become a stripper. And so since we were in a romantic relationship, I went to him and I informed him of my plans. It's like, look, I'm going to be turning 21. This is what I'm going to do. This is why I need to do it. And, you know, I hope that's okay with you because I need to do this in my life. And he looked at it and he was like, 
well, you know, I'm okay with you becoming a stripper, but I'm a little concerned that you're going to start just sleeping with lots of guys, and that's not really okay with me. Like, I'm a little worried about that. And I told him, like, dude, that's not why I'm becoming an exotic dancer. I'm becoming an exotic dancer because I need to fix me because I'm really broken. And I'm not the kind of person who just goes around hooking up with random people. So you don't have to worry about that. And he seemed to accept that. And he left it at that. And so I felt good about the situation. I talked with him about it. He seemed pretty okay with it. He seemed pretty on board with it, which meant that I was good to go ahead, and he wasn't going to give me a bunch of grief for going to the strip club and being a stripper, so everything's good, right? But he's a narcissist, and he lies constantly. So he looked at it, and this is stuff I've pieced together after the fact. He looked at it and realized that if he objected to me becoming an exotic dancer, that might cause some tension between the two of us. I might resent him. I might argue with him. I might give him some grief in that direction. So instead of telling me that he didn't want me to become a stripper, he wanted to show me why I shouldn't become a stripper. And so shortly before my 21st birthday, he told me about this friend of his who, you know, just a nice guy, just needed someone to hang out and watch TV with. And I didn't have any friends. Like, that was one of the reasons I wanted to go to the strip club. It's like, I work on an ambulance, and I don't see other human beings for, like, entire week-long blocks. And I need to be, like, at a bar somewhere where there are at least other human beings around me because I'm starting to develop social anxiety. Because I don't see other human beings, and it's bad. So I'm going to go to a bar, I'm going to get a job at a bar, and it's going to force me to be in a public setting you know, despite the fact that that causes me a lot of anxiety, it's going to force me to be in a public setting around people and try to readapt to being in society. <laughs> because after months and months of working on an ambulance where I just didn't see other human beings, I was starting to go a little bit crazy. Like, that, it, it wears at your sanity to be that heavily socially isolated. It is not healthy. And so it was wearing me down. That's one of the things. There was there were so many reasons I wanted to become a stripper. Like, they were good reasons. Anyway, so he tells me that this guy wants to hang out, and I'm like, you know what? I, I need that. I need that. And so that's, that's the thing about dealing with liars. Like, even if you know they're a liar, even if you're prepared for every single lie that they can possibly tell, sooner or later they're going to tell you something you want to hear, and it's a lot harder to notice the lie when it's something you really want to hear. So anyway, he tells me this guy wants to hang out and watch TV. Cool. That's exactly what I want. It's exactly what I want. And so I agree to go over to this guy's apartment and hang out with him for a while. Meanwhile, again, this is me piecing things together after the fact, he goes to this guy and he says, yeah, this girl, she, she wants to become an exotic dancer and she just doesn't have any kind of self-control around men, and she's going to end up fucking all these dudes. I just know she is. You know, she doesn't know how to hit the brakes. Um, she'll, she'll just do anything with anybody, and, you know, I think it's a problem. But, you know, what are you going to do? And she wants to hang out with you, so, you know, obviously she's going to be down to fuck, right? Do you see how this is creating, like, some, uh, some, some, some different expectations? <laughs> So obviously, you know, I show up at this guy's apartment and uh, we had a difference of opinion and he was quite literally more than twice my size. And so, you know, y'all can guess about how that ended up going down. Um, was he a paraphiliac? No, no, he wasn't a paraphiliac. He was a guy who was told that he was going to get some pussy that night. And when pussy showed up on his doorstep, he just didn't take no for an answer. You know? I'm not excusing his behavior. I am not excusing his behavior. He was a total douchebag. He was a piece of shit. Yeah, like, absolutely. But he was not a paraphiliac. I'll give you another example. My creepy coworker. My creepy coworker who tried to get me fired because I wasn't interested in having sex with him. Everybody who works with that guy knows he's a creeper. I, I talked with some of my coworkers. They were like, yeah, if one of these days he gets arrested for raping someone, no one is going to be surprised. 
I is he a paraphiliac? No. No, he's a pathetic man that no one wants. He's disgusting. He's an alcoholic. He refuses to take any kind of responsibility for himself. He's, you know, he's one of those creepy nice guy TM kinds of guys. Like, there are nice guys out there, nice guy TM guys, who just haven't figured out that their relationship style is unhealthy. And then there are nice guy TM guys where it's like, you're, you're bordering on creepy rapist, and you're not picking up on that fact, but you're scaring women away. Like, you are literally scaring women away from you. He was one of those where it was just like everyone kind of everyone around him kind of knew that if he ever found an opportunity to take advantage of a woman he would totally do it because that would be the, the only opportunity that he would have to get sex because he's so un, un, unattractive to pretty much any woman he meets the only chance that he's ever going to have to get laid is if he rapes somebody we all know it He's not a paraphiliac. He's just a dirtbag. So when she says, um, not every paraphiliac is a sex offender, but all sex offenders are paraphiliacs, she is wrong. I'm sorry. She's wrong. No matter how I look at it, no matter how much I think about it, no matter how much I ponder it, <clears throat> I think that this is one particular statement in which she just didn't quite get it right. Mm. Is there a strong correlation between paraphiliacs, uh, you know, paraphilic disorders and sex offense? Very strong correlation. Yeah. If you've got a if you've got a paraphilic disorder, you know, that's a very bad sign. If you've got a repeat sex offender on your hands, don't be surprised that they have a paraphilic disorder. I mean, that I'm not saying that there's I'm not saying we should just ignore paraphilic disorders because obviously they predispose a person to sexual offenses, which is bad. But I'm also not going to say, oh yeah, it's always a paraphilia. If you have a paraphilia, you're automatically predisposed to this. Remember, somewhere out there in the world, there's a nice little man who lives in an apartment by himself and cuddles balloons. That's happening in the world right now as we speak. He's not hurting anything. And at 19 minutes and 40 uh, seconds, she repeats it. All sex offenders have a paraphilia, including your everyday workaday rapist. No, no, no. Some guys goes to some guy goes to a club, and he has a few too many drinks, and he gets a little strong armed with a girl. I'm not excusing the behavior. It's still rape. It's still wrong. It's still a sex offense. But that's kind of the point. You do not have to have a paraphilia to commit a sex offense must be clear about that. A few notes, a few things that I would like to see in the future. I, I, and these are things that I would like to just see in the world in the future. I'm not saying, oh yeah, Buck and Eve should have done this um, in their conversation because their conversation was clearly focused on paraphilic disorders. That's one subject and it's a very complicated a very nuanced subject. So the fact that they covered it is fantastic. They talked about it for an hour. There was so much information going through that interview. It was fascinating. It was wonderful. So, mm hmm. Oh, I hate my body. I'm just very pregnant. That's what's going on. Everything that's happening to me right now, the fact that I can't sit up straight, the fact that I can't breathe, the fact that I can't stop coughing, I'm just really pregnant and I really hate it. Anyway, um, the, 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 the conversation they had is just beautiful. They did a great job. I've only covered 20 minutes of it. I'm probably going to stop there because this is already a very overly long video. But there are some things I want to see in the future. Just things that I think, like if you're watching this video and you're thinking about these issues, this is what I want to see manifesting in the world in the future. So they had an in-depth conversation about paraphilic disorders. That's really important. What I want to do is I want to have an in-depth conversation about the role of narcissistic personality disorder in the trans community. I think that pairs nicely with the paraphilic disorder conversation that they had. There is some crossover between paraphilic disorders or at least paraphilias 
I think it is paraphilic disorders. I need to go back. It's in the Cambridge article. So if you want to read that whole big long article, it's fascinating. It's really interesting. But I, I haven't screenshotted every interesting thing that I found in there because it was a long article and there were a lot of interesting things. Narcissistic personality disorder plays a role in the trans community. Narcissism plays a role in the trans community. I've been thinking that I need to make a video about that. I've been really dragging my feet. I need to I need to get on that. I've I've been hesitant far too long on that one. But I think that that's something that people need to be talking about. They need to be talking about the fact that there are narcissists in the trans community. Everybody knows it, but they don't know how they don't know enough about how narcissism functions. Like your average lay person doesn't understand what narcissism is. They don't. Your average lay person wouldn't be able to recognize a narcissist if he walked up and bit them on the ass. And I include myself in this. There are plenty of narcissists who just slip by. And that's very easy for narcissists to do because if you think about it, if a narcissist was easy to identify and everybody knew that they should avoid that person because that person is bad, they wouldn't be a very effective narcissist. I want to do a video on that. I want to open up that discussion. I want people to be having that discussion. That's something I'm hoping will occur in the future. And the other thing that I want to see just kind of manifested out in the world, something that I noticed in the BDSM community, uh, you know, a decade ago, what happened was I was hanging out kind of on BDSM forums in the BDSM community. I had some friends who were, BDS, you know, into BDSM. And then, you know, because I was married, I started having babies. And I've been pregnant for most of a decade now. So all my memories of the community are outdated by 10 years. I understand the world has definitely changed when it comes to the trans community. And I wouldn't be surprised if things have changed in the BDSM community as well. But a decade ago, there were some things about the BDSM community that were extremely healthy. And one of the things that I always noticed about that community that I think the trans community needs to adopt as well, just about every BDSM website, forum, what have you that I went on to, there was always very prominently displayed multiple links to multiple articles on safe practices. Now, obviously, if you've got something like BDSM where there's going to be, you know, whips and chains and ropes and bondage and, you know, possibly some suffocation and some sharp objects, you, you do need to have, like, safe practices, obviously, for the physical things. But it wasn't just the physical things. It was also safe practices within your relationship with your partner. Because, and this goes back to the whole, um, you know, People who have paraphilias who can form consensual relationships tend to have a higher IQ. You can form very healthy, very strong, very stable relationships as a person with a paraphilia if you find a compatible partner. However, in a community like the BDSM community, that's not the only kind of person who's showing up in that community. There are also going to be people who are narcissistic, sociopathic, predatory in some fashion or another, manipulative, coercive, unhealthy, or toxic. So many articles, so many articles. Every forum I went to, there was always a, a, a link very prominently displayed these are warning signs to look out for. These are red flags to look out for. If you're meeting up with a partner and they start doing X or Y or Z, if they start acting this way right here or that way right there, you get out of that situation because that person isn't safe. So many warnings. And I loved that about the community because it's like, it was a good community. It might still be a good community, but I haven't seen it in 10 years. So, you know, but at 10 years ago, it was a good community. There were a lot of really healthy people. There were a lot of people who were really, really committed to being healthy within that community. And I really, I really enjoyed that community because the, the overall spirit of it was very positive and very healthy. 
which might sound strange to people who never really interacted with that community before. But one of the things that was just so gorgeous about it was the fact that they were very much aware that not everybody plays nice. And so we have to warn people. We have to we have to support people. We have to kind of tell people, hey, if you if you're getting a bad vibe from this person, you get the hell away from them. If you're picking up some red flags from this person, you get the hell away from them. You need to be safe because not everybody in this community is a nice person. Most of us are. Most of us are good people. But there are some predators who find their way in here every once in a while. And when they do, they can be very destructive. So we have to warn each other and we have to watch each other's backs. And we have to be hyper alert to the possibility that someone who's predatory or toxic is going to find their way into our community. If the trans community adopted this attitude, I think it would clear up so much of the shit that's in the trans community right now. If, if we started doing this, I think it would clear up so much bullshit. And that's why I need to make a video about narcissism because, you know, because what does the trans community actually know about narcissism? When's the last time that you were hanging out with a bunch of trans people? And I mean, obviously, I'm not really part of the community. So for all I know, they're trying to, you know, trying to mop up this mess. And it's just so vastly messy that it's like you got your little teeny mop and your little teeny bucket. And you're, you're dabbing away as fast as you can, but it's not really doing much. But I don't see many conversations in the trans community about red flags to look for, narcissistic behaviors and what those might look like, any of that stuff. And... The trans community needs that stuff. They need it in the same way that the BDSM community had it 10 years ago, where it's everywhere. Every trans forum you go to, these are red flags. These are things to look out for. This is what coercive behavior looks like. Do not let someone manipulate you. Do not let someone mistreat you. You deserve better. Don't let people prey upon you because there are predators who will try to come into our community and they will try to do bad things to you if we could have that happen in the trans community i think that we'd see a lot of improvement like really dramatic improvement so that's something that's on my wish list it's like okay if i could have one wish and just see it kind of manifest itself in the world i think that would be a really cool thing to have happen and so that's something i think Having having worked on this video, having taken all the notes for this video, having like read up on some of this stuff, I think that's something that I'm going to start pushing for in the future is raising awareness of narcissistic behaviors and trying to help inform the trans community. I, I think that we need to start doing this. In order to do community cleanup, I think this is the effective way to do it. I think having conversations like Buck and Eve had in this in this video right here, I think that's a really good first step to raising awareness that yes there are predators in the trans community and no we should not just blindly acceptance and tolerance um predators who are actively hunting us should not be tolerated why why would they be tolerated if you're trying to hurt me i shouldn't have to tolerate you so i think that we we need we need that awareness. I think we need to start spreading that awareness. And I think that's going to be really good for all of us. I think it's going to be good for people outside of the trans community too because they're starting to feel this this coercion and this push from inside the trans community and it's left a really bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. And that's not what the community necessarily should be about. I think we all deserve better. And so let's build better. I think that's everything. I think that's all my notes. I kind of rambled a bit, but I think I pretty well covered it. Um, that's only 20 minutes of the video. Like, they did, they, they talked for over an hour. So I've only covered, like, the first 20-minute slice. It's a really interesting video. I, obviously, some of these things were just concerns of mine. Uh, the two big ones being there is a differentiation that should be made between a paraphilic disorder and a paraphilia. Not necessarily the same thing. Very important to distinguish between those two separate things. Um, and then also the fact that not every rapist, not every sex offender is going to be a paraphiliac. Is there a high correlation? Absolutely. 
but you can't just say, oh, if you have a paraphilia, you're predisposed to rape. That's, that, I, I believe that that is inaccurate. Um, I believe that stating it in that way is not accurate. So those two things are kind of issues that I sort of look at and say, okay, we need to, we need to pull this out and talk about it. We, we, and, and honestly, if we pull this out and we debate it back and forth, that's cool with me too. As long as that discussion is taking place so that we can find some clarity and make sure that we're being accurate in our discussions moving forward. Because if we have a chain of logic that we're building up and we get one of the links really, really early on in the chain wrong, and every single link after that is kind of hanging off of that one faulty link, it's not going to be a very strong change. So I want to try my very best to, you know, l let's make sure that we're very clear on these things. Um, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm really happy they had this discussion. I'm really happy they put out this video. Um, we need to have these discussions. We need to talk about the nature of autogynephilia. We need to talk about the role of narcissism in the trans community. We need to talk about the dangers of paraphilic disorders. Um, I'm going to cut the video off right there. It's way too long as it is. Half of it is me just hacking up a lung so I can at least edit that out. Um, I hope you guys are all having a wonderful week, and I will talk to you guys later.